and Cordelia uh, and Corey, it's all you. All right, thanks, Zach, and welcome. Today, we're going to talk about the use of plant growth regulators to grow your business. Uh, the primary focus today, the product that we'll talk about, will be shortstop, and we'll go into more on that later. Just as Zach said, as you get questions or have comments, please type them into the chat box. We're more than happy to address those as uh, we, we reach the end of the presentation. So my name is Corey. I'm the arborist out here in the Rocky Mountain region. I've been in the tree industry for uh, a little over 20 years or so, uh, working between nurseries, climbing, and then uh, went to school for this, urban forestry, tree physiology, and uh, found a passion uh, helping people grow businesses and save trees. So uh, hopefully we can bring some of that insight to you today, see if there's something maybe that we can help you with in the future. So if you look up on the map there, you'll see that uh, my territory is the Rocky Mountain area, but uh, all over the country, including into Canada, we have reps, technicians, and specialists in each field. You're more than welcome to uh, reach out to any of them at any point during this presentation, or uh, if you head over to our website right after, you'll be able to get that information as well. So we're all here, we all wanna see you succeed, and uh, if it's a good fit, we're happy to help. All right, so as we start talking about things that are going on in our industry, the biggest issue that we hear, and we work with quite a few different companies and manufacturers, the biggest issue we hear is that nobody can find skilled labor. And according to Forbes, if you were to look back last year, you'd find that there's quite a big gap. A lot of jobs, not a lot of people willing to fill them. And uh, I think this year is going to be particularly interesting with uh, the current state of affairs. So we know that there's an issue with the skilled labor. We, there are jobs all over the job market, all sorts of openings, all sorts of employers trying to reach out and find people to fill those positions. But if you look at the line for the hires, that doesn't seem to be going up. And yeah, the data is about five, six years old, but I, I would suspect that trend is pretty consistent. And working with many business owners, you've probably seen the same thing. So what are the business owners doing? Right? What, are you, what are you guys doing? You're putting up help wanted signs. But if you look back at that graph, those help wanted signs probably aren't being filled all the time. Skilled labor is kind of something we smile at, but um, what do you do? Uh, what, do what do all the major tree turf landscape companies going to do when they've got all these positions but can't find somebody to fill them? So uh, I look at this, and maybe you could look at this, as the existing labor force that you have and the existing talent pool that you have is extremely valuable, and we need to find out how we can maximize those man hours and the personnel that we already have. The biggest way to probably do that would be to reduce labor. Here comes what we're gonna talk about today, which is, which is primarily gonna be focused on plant growth regulators, okay? So bear with me for a moment. If we're looking to reduce labor, it could look something like this. In a typical summer, depending on where you are in the country, you might show up to trim a hedge. So you'll, you'll do the spring cleaning in you know, March, maybe April. Then it's going to grow back in. You're going to come back right before the 4th of July and do another hard shear shaping event. That progresses once again throughout the summer and then maybe even one more time before the fall. So you've got to come up with the crew to come out there and go do all this maintenance. The, the proposal that I have for you would be to consider this. Why don't you show up in the spring, do that aggressive cutback, spray it with some short stuff, and then maybe come back with just your Felcos, maybe one or two of the crew, and just snip out some of the, some of the uh, sprigs and the runaways that didn't get regulated. Maybe come back one more time before the end of the summer and do it again. What would that look like for you, or your organization, if that was something you were able to do? Could be cool. We're doing a trial in South Carolina with one of our field reps. He's working with a landscape company and we're gonna use this as a case study. In 2018, this company basically showed up and they did four full shearing and shaping events. This is on Holly for anybody who's lived out east 
Um, this is something that, that gets sheared and shaped pretty regularly. So over the course of the summer, they came out about four times. They had about eight man hours or so per trip. Don't worry, it was not just on this hedge. That comes to about 32 man hours for the entire season. Okay, that's, that's quite a time investment. What they did in 2019 to be part of the trial is they treated the plant before it really started to push its new growth for the season. Then they came back and they did three light tip pruning events in 16 weeks. Um, they spent a lot less time there because all they had was a couple little sprigs that they had to prune out that didn't get regulated. They were spending about two man hours per trip. That's six man hours per season. So about this time, there'll be two pools of people. One group is gonna say, hey, we get paid by the hour. We're out there, that 32 to six, that's a, that's a pretty big hit. That's a pretty big decrease in man hours. The other pool is gonna look at it and go, we get paid to maintain that hedge or that property, whether we're there for 32, 50, 100, doesn't matter. They're getting paid for the results. So if we can cut down and save some hours there, it's a great opportunity, right? The reason they were able to do this and how you might be able to do this as well is to incorporate a product called Shortstop 2SC, and that's an ArborJet product. The SC, folks, just stands for suspended concentrate, and the two just indicates or hints at the two pounds of active uh, per acre. So keep, keep that in mind. Try not to get caught up in the weeds on that. The active ingredient is Paclobutrazole. That's an Azol product, A-Z-O-L, and it's 22 and a third percent. Now, that's going to be important, and we'll discuss more in just a little bit. It's sold as a plant growth regulator, even though we know that there are dozens of other secondary benefits for it. Uh, but when you put it on a work order, at least here in Colorado, it needs to say that you're doing it for plant growth regulation. The um, Department of Ag really, really likes to see that. It's sold as a soil application for trees. And we also have a new and improved soil and foliar label on it for shrubs. So it gives the applicator a little bit of flexibility. Also, it allows the applicator to mix up on the spot, custom batches, uh, large or small batches as well, okay? So how does this product actually work? What Shortstop is, or Paclobutrazole is, is it's a product that no matter if you soil apply it or foliar spray, this product accumulates in the buds. It's in these buds, in the apical meristem, where this chemical reaction is happening, where all these hormones are, are basically being generated and come into life within the plant. So when you apply shortstop, there are two main changes that will happen within the plant. The first is a reduction in gibberellic acid. And we don't wanna to get too far into the weeds on this, but gibberellic acid is basically a cell elongation hormone. So that's to say, if you apply this product, you will have less cell elongation. A, a key distinction between this product and some of the other products on the market is that shortstop does not affect the number of cells that are there, just how big they're gonna get. Some of the other growth regulators on the market actually are mitosis inhibitors, and some are even closer to herbicides, and shortstop is not that. So it's just affecting how big the cells will get. Well, when we apply shortstop, and we're talking about these primary changes, if we have less cell elongation, that means we're gonna be showing up to do less pruning. It also says that we're gonna save more time because we're not sending crews out there to do so much pruning. If they're not doing that much pruning or shearing, then you can also save time on cleanup. Obviously results in your financial savings. The second change that happens within those buds and within the plant is an increase in abscisic acid. So this is a cell protection or a plant protection hormone. So you have one pool, growth regulation. You have the second pool, these secondary benefits, right? Think tree protection. We found that when you soil apply or spray shortstop onto a plant, what you will see is disease resistance, as well as drought resistance and an improved plant appearance. And there have been numbers, uh, numerous studies to 
show and validate our findings. And we'll get into those in just a second as well. So let's talk about those primary changes, those uh, growth regulation changes, if you will. Well, here's a study that we did with Michigan State a number of years ago on a bunch of nine barks. And this was, I believe, soil applied shortstop. And what they found is that they treated, they treated half the trees on one side of this dormitory, and then they left the other half as a control. And the results they found were actually pretty amazing. They found that the plants that they treated put on well, just a fraction of the growth, 25 maybe percent of the growth that the other plants put on. The big savings for them was they didn't have all the summer help that they were expecting that they wanted. So to go and do these shearing and shaping events two, maybe three times a season would have been impractical. They also have difficulty getting rid of some of the debris. And I would put it that a lot of folks that we're working with also have difficulty <laughs> disposing of debris. So by doing uh, these treatments, they found that they could just come back in and do some tip pruning. They're making a lot less fewer trips to the dump, so they're not paying to dump as much. And they're spending a lot less time cleaning up. In fact, one of the notes that we have on this study was that uh, in many cases, they were able just to clip some of the tips off, throw them into the turf, and then as the mower went by, they were just able to run over them and mulch them up. So it's actually kind of cool. And uh, shortstop will work a little bit differently depending on what species it's in. It's going to do the same hormone uh, change no matter what the plant is, but some species are a little bit more sensitive than others. So even after 10 weeks, some of the ewes will be regulated. You're going to need to use a little bit more product uh, on the evergreens and ewes, but you're still going to get that growth regulation. This is for Scythia, obviously in a container plant. You can see just by looking at it that it, it looks a lot better kept together. It looks a lot more maintained, even though it, it hasn't been altered other than the treatment. So it's pretty neat. Here's a property in Arizona that the homeowner basically didn't want to go out there and, and prune or have, her, have her, her crews prune and shear this property three or four times a summer. Obviously, you can see there's a little bit of a conflict with the water feature in the backyard. So in this case, they wanted it kind of to have that natural appearance, but didn't want all those visits. So use a plant growth regulator like shortstop to keep it in check. The result will be a lot less, a lot less hours from the, uh, the pool cleaner, as well as your technicians. If you have somebody that has to go out there and rake and sweep and get all involved, just a better, just a better choice in this case. Well, where would we be if we had this presentation and we were talking about shortstop if we didn't address safety, right? In our, ish, in our industry, one of the key issues that we're facing is safety because anybody, maybe even you, have gone onto YouTube and you've learned how to do some of these new things. Like uh, for instance, maybe hedge cutting with a chainsaw, right? Well, in our industry, there's not a whole lot more dangerous than YouTube and power tools. Well, maybe a ladder or two ladders and some power tools. So if we can cut down on people that have to go out there with multiple ladders and power tools to go shear or shape a hedge, we're so much better off. Uh, forget the labor savings, let's save the trip to the ER, right? Okay, so that was on the growth control side of things. Now let's get into the secondary changes, the increase in plant hormones that we've been talking about, those defense hormones specifically. And these are some of the things that uh, we work all over the country with, with our end users to try to find maybe different cures or different, um, different treatment practices that you could use. We just want to give you options to find out what works best. Well, in an article that was published by ISA a number of years ago, they wanted to figure out what kind of effects would paclobutrazol have on some containerized plants. And the results they found were that there's an increase in drought resistance. And if we think about why this happens from the plant perspective, it's putting on a thicker, waxier leaf. So it's gonna transpire or give off less water than what it would otherwise. So we were doing a research trial out here in Colorado with some folks at what they call church. 
course, you all know it as a Whole Foods market. And if you look at the trees between the Whole Foods market and the Walmart parking lot, you'll notice that even though it's midsummer, a lot of those trees are starting to lose their leaves. It's a little unsightly, right? And that's certainly not something that you would want to put your name behind, certainly if you're managing the parking lot trees. So we did a trial back in 2017, basically looked at a bunch of lindens side by side. And we went and treated the linden on the left with the recommended dose of baclobutrazol. 2018 went by, it was dry. 2019, uh, a summer in the front range here in Colorado that had some good moisture. So we thought, ah, we'll see what happens. We came by, the tree on the left that we treated looks phenomenal. The tree on the right, our check or untreated tree, was still pretty torched out. It didn't look as bad as it did in 2017, but it still looked pretty torched out. And if you actually look a little bit closer at those leaves, what you'll find in the untreated versus the treated is pretty remarkable. For anybody who's ever used paclobutrazol to um, treat trees or experimented with it, what you'll find is those leaves come out a little bit thicker, a little bit thicker, a little bit waxier. So those trichomes or those hairs are also going to prevent any additional water loss. So you have a thicker waxier leaf, you have more of those hairs, so that, that leaf is really, really better suited to handle some of those aggressive environments. We talk about improved appearance as well. Out here in Colorado, our soils are awful. And we have a running joke out here that if EAB doesn't put our kids through college, uh, maybe some of these maples will. And we found that parking lot maples, they just get absolutely torched out anywhere in the West here. So uh, at least they have a small ring of mulch around them. So maybe a little drip emitter. So maybe we're giving them a little hope. Well, if you can go, go back and get these trees on a rotation where you're going to treat them every third year with shortstop, you're going to have a remarkable looking tree even a year later. We should also note that that tree was also treated with Minjet FE, which is our iron and manganese chelate. But if you look in the background in that photo, the background on the other side of the parking lot, you'll see that the turf in 2018 was much greener than it was in 2019, yet the tree looks considerably better. Something worth noting. Something worth noting. You could take these autumn blaze maples anywhere out here in the West and find this. Beautiful maples, beautiful fall color in July. And if you can just take that same method that we were talking about, that trunk injection with an iron chelate, as well as a soil application, short stop, you're gonna see some pretty remarkable changes within the plant. You're actually gonna buy that plant a lot of time. If you think about it from the plant's perspective, why does it want to be green? What's the point of having the green, right? It's to try to catch, to catch the sun's rays so that it can make food for itself. And if you have a yellow tree, quite frankly, it's not being very efficient with that process. And that's going to result in a less healthy tree that's going to be more open to different diseases, insects, things like that. So here's a quote we got out of California just saying that her trees look much, much greener this time of year. And um, pretty remarkable what this product will do. And we talked a little bit earlier about how it's gonna be species specific on the label. Not every species is gonna to react to the product the same. Um, ash is one where you could, you would be hard pressed to over-regulate that tree. You could put quite a bit on and um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna cause too much over-regulation. But those secondary benefits, regardless of the species, are still gonna be there. It's pretty neat. For any of our landscape professionals, spirea, it's a fun one, no matter where you go. But if you notice, some of these spireas in the landscape, as you go throughout the summer, they actually start to get a little bit yellowy, maybe even brown around the edges in appearance. And then what happen is they dry out, or maybe they have to compete against some other perennials or other things for water and nutrients. Well, if you go ahead and spray them early in the spring, what you'll find is they stay green a lot longer. They're not worried about competing against some of the other ground covers and other things. 
they're also going to have a slightly thicker leaf. And an observation that's been made about some of the plants that have been treated would be, hey, Corey, they appear like they have more flowers. Is that true? Well, it would make sense being a tree protection and defense hormone that's getting triggered. But I would almost say that because these plants are being less spindly, they're almost maintaining more of a compact shape. So I don't know if we can, um, I don't know if we can really back up the more flowering, but certainly gives a nicer appearance. I think that that's pretty hard to argue. In the Midwest, one of the bigger issues that they see on some of the shrubs with transplant shock, would be transplant shock and winter desiccation. Uh, pretty common shrub back in the Midwest is boxwood. And you know that if you don't cover these plants the first year or two that they're in the ground, maybe even longer, depending on the winter, uh, they can dry out pretty easily. So what we found is that if you can spray it a little bit earlier um, during the growing season, what you'll find is you'll have that more compact shape, but that thicker, waxier leaf is also helping the plant hold on to a little bit more moisture. So the results are pretty fun. I would, we would encourage people, if, if you haven't played with this yet, to just give it a try. One of the common questions that we get would be, what kind of effects will shortstop have on some of the funguses, some of the diseases that maybe you have in your part of the world? Well, uh, one of the research studies that was published by Jacobs and Berg would go on to say this. The fungicidal activity of paclobutrazol makes it especially appealing for managing woody plant diseases. Now, every disease is a little bit different, but we'll talk, we'll talk here in just a second about maybe the top few that you might be seeing and how paclobutrazol might be able to help. The first one would be powdery mildew. Now, this is something where if, if the homeowner or whoever's managing the property can go ahead and just adjust, adjust the nozzle on whatever rotator or irrigations around it, you're going to spread this fungus a lot less. Maybe, maybe you won't even spread it at all. Um, but we see this pop up all the time. And once again, this is, another, this is another pest where if we can just treat it, just get there early as, as that leaf tissue is still soft and in, in its very early stages of development and treat it, we're not gonna have to worry about powdery mildew as much. Pretty remarkable. Of course, we, we would like to change that site, make sure that it's not getting any of that water and moving the spores from, from leaf to leaf. But in this instance, it's actually pretty remarkable. Another fungus, another foliar fungus that we'll see from time to time is this black leaf spot. It's extremely common um, on a number of different roses. And what this is, is it's a fungus that'll, that'll hop from leaf to leaf to leaf as water droplets hit it. It'll move the spores all over the place. Well, if it's doing that, obviously the plant doesn't have those green leaves to pull in sunlight to make food for itself. So it might not lead to death of the plant, certainly not in the short term, but it, it is pretty unsightly. And if you're a landscape professional and you're looking at that and you're going, well, we, typically haven't had much of an option. Well, now you do. We found once again that some of the roses treated with this product will have these waxier, greener leaves. And the remarkable thing is that if you soil apply it, it's gonna last a little bit longer than if you foliarly spray it. So once again, can't back up that there are more flowers on these plants, but the appearance sure is improved. Well, what about apple scale? That's another foliar fungus. And what about Cytospora canker? That's a big issue, especially in the Midwest um, and here in the West on our spruce trees. Well, Dr. Gary Watson, as well as Dr. Jacobs got together and they did a research trial on this a number of years ago, eight, nine years ago. Yeah. What they found with, was that natural infections of the disease may be controlled with a one-time soil application of this active ingredient. So if you're seeing apple scab, what most companies will do is they'll show up two to three times during the early growing season as those leaves are elongating, as they're getting bigger, because that's when the fungus is spreading. 
it's got the right moisture, it's got the right temperature for that fungus to really move. Well, if you've ever been in production for a while, you know that timing three sprays in the spring while it's raining, and maybe you have a, a large service area, so maybe not all the plants are push and leap at the same time, it could be almost impossible. I would propose to you, why not hit it sometime when the ground isn't frozen with a little bit of shortstop? Those leaves, actually, it's a pretty good photo of what those leaves will look like when treated. A little waxier, a little shinier, no apple scab fungus. And that's something that you could couple with maybe a trunk injection, or maybe you could rotate uh, every few years with the trunk injection. Might be something worth noting. Well, what about Cytospora canker? Ah, Cytospora canker and spruce. Problematic because it, it gives this peppery uh, to the canopy where you'll see limbs die off, not in a consistent pattern. If it was maybe bark beetles, you'd see that top down death or that spiral of death, girdling roots, maybe something similar. Rhizosphere and needle cast, you'd see a lot more. Um, a lot more purple, maybe maybe even some brownie needles, but it would be pretty consistent. Cytospora canker, not so much. Uh, in fact, it'll even look like hail damage unless you get real close. For anybody who has seen this before, you'll be able to relate to this, but if you, if you look closely at those cankers, um, it'll actually be oozing, and with cytospora canker, it'll ooze out almost a, blue, a, bluish, a bluish hue um, that, that you won't get with of hail damage. So it's, it's something to know. So in this research trial that uh, Dr. Watson did, what they found is that if you do absolutely nothing, if you just let the plant be, what's going to happen is cytospora canker will propagate and it will move and proliferate within that plant. Populations are going to go up and that's over about a one year, maybe two year trial. Well, if you apply short stop, even, even at the labeled rate and nothing more, what you'll get is almost instant control. So we need to think about that and why that works. Well, the active ingredient in shortstop is paclobutrazole, azole. Think about that maybe having some fungicidal characteristics to it. Think of some, some of the other fungicides that you might use, propozole, propiconazole. I would also say that because we know cytospora canker is exacerbated or it'll move more when it's droughty out, we know the secondary benefits of putting it down are thicker, waxier needles and leaves and more fibrous roots. So that would lead us to believe that just by doing this, we're relieving some of the stress and hopefully controlling that canker. So one of the common questions that we typically get about now is, well, what happens if you overregulate? You know, what, what can go wrong with this, with this kind of treatment? Well, overregulation does happen, unfortunately. And we have a protocol in case it happens to you. Just ask one of your reps or call the office and we'll get it to you. But what'll absolutely happen 100% of the time, guaranteed, is that if short stop, when mixed or straight, when it touches turf, it it will absolutely torch your turf out. It'll turn it white. Now on the label, and we'll discuss it in just a second, it's gonna talk about digging a little moat and applying the product directly to the base of the tree in that moat, okay? In this instance, the individuals did not get that comment. They just mixed it up in a five gallon bucket, dumped it around the base of the tree. Now, the tree will be just fine. The turf, on the other hand, will probably need to be replaced. Now, another important thing to note here is that short stop, when soil applied, will not kill a tree. There's no phytotoxicity within short stop. So if a tree torches out or dies within days or weeks of this product being applied to the ground, it's probably not because of the product. Uh, short stop moves pretty slow into and within the plant. So if if we were going to apply short stop, we wouldn't expect any of the effects to take place until new growth comes out. So if you're applying it spring, maybe even right now, we don't know that you're going to see those thicker waxy leaves now, but certainly next year you will. Another thing to note about overregulation is that not all species like the product the same. So a plant that you really need to be careful with 
would be Japanese maple. Almost uh, doesn't need a lot. You could almost open the bottle on the property near Japanese maple and it'll look like this. Something to note about that is it's it kind of looks like a Dr. Seuss tree where just it just has these tufts of leaves all over. But um, yeah, when they're like the size of your finger, um, it wasn't desirable by these people, let's just say. If you're gonna go ahead and use shortstop on shrubs, something that you'll notice, especially when you foliarly apply it, is that you could get what we call skips, rogue sprouts, or runaways. And that would be that, would be that little guy right there. Now, because we want this product to accumulate in the buds, if those buds aren't formed, when you're going to do the application, you're gonna see quite a bit of that. And if you're doing hedges, yeah, you're gonna get some of these skips. So if you remember back to, um, <laughs> to the Lego graph that we were showing you, uh, remember how he's just coming back with a pair of Felcos, just, to, just some hand snips to go and, and snip out some of those runaways? Might be a good idea. But you can see even, even eight to 10 weeks later that there will be some work to do, but it's gonna be a whole lot less debris and a whole lot less time. Also, when you come back after that eight to 10 weeks, you can go ahead and spray this hedge again. Hopefully you can just continue to keep it in check. So let's discuss soil application for shrubs. Anytime you're doing soil application, whether it's for trees or shrubs, the label asks that you mix it at an 11 to one ratio. Now that's important, that's extremely important. When we talk about the foliar spray, that's gonna be a little bit different. But soil applying this, it needs to be the 11 to one, regardless of the species. So you could mix up a big batch, if you knew what species you were gonna treat, you could mix up a big batch and you could spread that batch out for the course of the day. And that would be fine and acceptable as long as the product can maintain agitation. If you're going to treat shrubs via soil, we suggest that you do a little moat or drench, which could just involve you taking out the little trowel and making a little moat around the base of the plant. If you're going to use a probe, make sure that it's extremely accurate. We're talking about, we're talking about to the mill on how much product you're putting down. Obviously, overregulation can happen. It's no joke. So if you're going to go that route, make sure your probe is extremely accurate. Make sure you're also applying it evenly. If you're seeing girdling roots, or maybe, um, maybe it's a, a plant that has a couple of canes or a couple of stems coming out of the ground, make sure that you're digging the moat all the way around to give that product uh, the best chance it can to move into each part of the plant accordingly. And then see the label. As we've been discussing today, we just came out with a new shrub label. Um, so make sure you, you, you're referencing that pretty regularly. This is a product, this is a treatment that no matter how comfortable or how many times you've done it before, we always suggest reading the label. Label is the law. We'll have the label up for this product uh, shortly on our website, and I'm sure we'll have some changes to it as well. But it's gonna be extremely easy to read, to reference, we'll talk about milliliters or ounces, depending on where you are and what you're familiar with. And once again, this would be the drench rate for the soil rate. So that's the 11 to 1 ratio, and then you go from there. Hey, and that's what, a, that's what a moat will look like. You take your garden trowel, and you just pop back some of the rocks or the mulch, mix it up in a bucket, dump it around the base. It's pretty low tech, but the results are going to be pretty great. So let's talk about foliar application with shrubs. This is where there's a huge market for it especially if you're managing some of these big properties. Um, this foliar application is going to make a huge difference. So there is an equation where you can find out how many cubic feet you're looking to regulate, and then you can go to the label and mix up that much. It's actually pretty easy. You just have to play with it once or twice. When we're doing this foliar application, what we're doing is we're mixing straight product into water according to the label. We are not doing the 11 to 1 ratio solution and then mixing it to water. We're doing straight product to water. We'll walk through one of those in just a second. It's key that you're using a non-ionic surfactant. The reason we're doing this is because we want to break up that water tension 
and we want to get that product to really, really stick to those leaves and that leaf surface. Okay, mission, mission, mission important right here. You need need to do that. Another big thing is to keep it agitated. If you're going out there and you're putting in a backpack sprayer, agitation is going to be pretty easy because you're going to be bouncing around from side to side as you're walking between the plants. Some of our bigger clients who are using this on theme parks or large hedges will actually mix up a 100 gallon batch of this. As long as you have even jet agitation, you'll be, you'll be pretty good. Um, jet agitation and JD9, if you're doing some of those bigger properties, will serve you pretty well. Just remember, uh, one gallon of solution covers about three to 400 cubic feet. So that's just a little note, just a little note, taking some of the math out of it for you. Here's the shrub uh, foliar spray rate. If you just look at the top one, Abelia, uh, it's gonna tell you to mix up one to three and a half ounces, and you can go species by species, but ounces, that's ounces of active, not one to three ounces of 11 to one ratio, that's just active. And of course, we'll be updating this and modifying uh, the label as well and getting it on the website as soon as possible. So let's discuss technique briefly here. Something key is that we want to spray to drip. So uh, some of the other treatments that maybe you're doing out there, it just says spray till wet, spray till saturate. In this case, we want to spray till drip. And remember what we discussed is we really want to cover all of the foliage all of the stems, all of those buds, because that's where the real change is happening. I would also say that if you're spraying to drip like this, you're probably gonna get a little bit of runoff and it's gonna accumulate at the base of the plant. So you're gonna get some of, some of those effects as well. When you go ahead and spray it, be sure that you're covering the entire plant. It's really easy for an applicator to just go out there and dust the front of it or spray both sides, but not the back. So in this instance, you want to make sure that you're also spraying behind the plant towards the wall. Something that you can do to minimize how much product you're losing would be apply it in the morning or late afternoon, certainly not in the heat of the day. Uh, if you can apply it in the low or no wind, that's even better because you're not going to have any product leave the site. And then if you have high humidity, you're probably going to get a little bit better sticking to the plant. Um, and you're going to be more effective with your treatments. Once again, be sure you have that non-ionic surfactant in there to make sure that it sticks. Something that we'd like to point out is that you would apply this product two to eight days after a shear or shaping event. As we discussed, we really want those buds to start forming. It's not always necessary to prune. So if you had a higher end uh, property that you're taking care of, make sure that you're doing that shearing and shaping event, and then you're coming back later that week to do the, uh, the shortstop application. If you like that natural look, as a number of clients do, but they don't want it to get too long and leggy, freeze it in place right there. Hit it when you're ready. Um, and those results will last, like we've been discussing, eight, 10, 12 weeks, depending on the species and the climate. May seem like common sense, but in the world we live in today, that I guess doesn't really exist, but uh, don't, don't prune, shear, or shape those plants if you can help it right after you've made that application because you're gonna be removing that product that you just put down. Um, and you will get any, any, any rogue sprouts as we discussed earlier, any of those runaways that kind of pop up. Be sure that you're also waiting that eight to 12 weeks between treatment. Once again, I'll ask that you reference the label when it comes to retreatment intervals. Um, but keep in mind too that growth rates are going to be different depending on where you are in the country. For instance, things where I live at 9,000 feet aren't growing nearly as quick as what they will in South Carolina or Florida or Arizona. So make sure that you're monitoring it and following the label's advice. In conclusion, the biggest uses for shortstop would be plant growth regulator. Less pruning, your budget goes further, your man hours go further much, much further. You're also going to get an improved appearance. So whether it's chlorosis or early leaf drop or whatever you're worried about, we would suggest experimenting, play around a little bit, see how that plant reacts to it. Feel free to give any of us a call and we'll walk you through some of our experiences with that product. Also, drought, as we're entering another year of mega drought, uh, this is going to be critical. 
think the trees that are treated, whether they're parking lot or not, are gonna look much healthier. We actually have clients out here in the West that say any of their trees that they've treated and they're now getting ready to inject, the trees that have been treated with shortstop in the past are pulling up product much quicker. And of course, they're referencing mostly oaks, ash, and maple with that statement. You can also use shortstop to help fight against some of those foliar diseases, as well as cytosper canker in spruce. Great way to save money, uh, as well as your labor and your manpower, as well as it's just a safe choice in many instances. It's a safer, uh, safer choice than ladders and power tools, that's for sure. So if you have any questions or you'd like to know about any of our experience, please feel free to reach out to one of us reps. We're always, we're always by our phone and we're always happy to work with you and share some of our experiences. If you go onto our website, um, you can find out where you can get the product or if somebody from the public is going online, they can find out where an applicator will also be. The nice thing about ArborJet and the, the amazing thing that we, can, that we can help you with is that we have this technical support line. So if you try to reach one of us or maybe your technicians try to reach one of us and we're in the field or we're working with someone else, if you would just call the technical support line, you'll get an answer. Somebody's waiting by the phone ready to help. Something also pretty neat about ArborJet that folks don't talk about much is that ArborJet does over 100 research trials a year. So there's a good chance that everybody on the map here is heavily involved in those research trials. We also have a team loaded of extremely smart people, PhDs, doctors, and many folks with years and years of experience that are heading up these research trials. So if there's a pest or a problem that maybe you're seeing that there's no real good solution for, or you'd like to know what what would be the best solution for, we're certainly happy to help, help you get there and uh, happy to help in any way possible. So with that, um, Zach, I'll let you take control and uh, maybe we can answer some questions.